Hello and welcome to episode 507 of the Bruce Wagner Show. Today is Technology Day, personal technology made easy. And uh, today we're going to be talking about one of the technologies that I think is most profound in in my life, in our life, um, and that is an operating system that replaces Windows and Mac operating systems called Ubuntu Linux. And our guest today is Matthew Jording from OpenGotham.com. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so the um, question to start off with is when someone asks you, okay, I've heard of Linux, I've heard that name, but what is it? Um, what I generally tell people is Linux is a operating system like Windows or Mac that can replace your dated um, operating system. Um, and uh, it's it's different from most operating systems and um, most software because it's not only free uh, as in, you know, it's, uh, free as in cost, but it's also uh, free in the respect that all of the source code, all of the guts that go into it are shared. And uh, so any fixes, any improvements, any software that works with it is available to everyone to contribute to. So the people who built Linux um, are everywhere. And, uh, and, the, and you can build Linux. And you can uh, and you can help fix Linux mm -hmm. when you uh, when you're using a Windows machine um, and something goes wrong. Um, you have to wait for Microsoft to acknowledge there's a problem um, and then go ahead and uh, and uh, send out a approved repair. Mm -hmm. um, Linux uh, Linux allows anyone to go ahead and make those fixes and then share them and places like. Ubuntu Linux will go ahead and acknowledge that very quickly and put that out as part of their official. Well, now you're a you're a programmer and you're a developer yourself. I am. So that you're referring to people obviously who are programmers. The average person is, um, pro if they're not a programmer, they're probably not going to be involved in fixing it. That's true. But but it does uh, it does actually improve the process of delivering software to a, uh, the average person. Right, because they take the feedback from the average people and they say they report bugs, right? Yeah, people, pe people, uh, who, people re report bugs all the time. There's a huge community around Linux. Linux is not just a, uh, um, a bunch of software. It's not, it's not consumer software um, in the respect that you go to a shop, you buy it, and mm -hmm. if there's a problem, you return it. Um, what happens is if there's a problem, you uh, give feedback to the community. The community talks about it. Sometimes they tell you, uh, you know, uh, no, you're doing it wrong. You have to do it this way. Um, it's very vibrant, uh, and sometimes, uh, sometimes there, uh, you know, people actually see a problem, and there's enough threshold that a fix is put in. Okay. Well, the way the way I explain it, when people ask me what it what it is and what it's about. This is this is how I explain it. Tell me if I'm right oh, yeah. or not. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I I use this analogy. I say imagine um, proprietary software companies like uh, Microsoft and Apple per se, uh, for example. I mean, um, produce software and it's um, it's like uh, the code itself. The actual programs are a secret. They're they're proprietary. They're owned by that corporation right. and they're not released to the public or to anyone, to any developers except internally. So I say, imagine if there was a bakery, a chain of bakeries like Starbucks, and you could buy these brownies, and they were fantastic brownies, but they're $10 a brownie. And the recipe is secret, like the Coca-Cola formula or Kentucky Fried Chicken's you know, secret recipe, ingredients, whatever. And they don't release the recipe to anybody. It's top dollar, and you can only buy them at that one bakery, but there's a ch you can buy them anywhere. The alternative, that's that's what proprietary companies are, like Microsoft and Apple and all these, these companies. The open source movement, which we call FOSS, right? F uh, free open source software movement, which Ubuntu Linux, all Linux, um, is a part of. Depending on who you talk to, it's either free software or open source. Um, and uh, and both labels have their own political implications. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. yeah. You can get... You can d discuss that down to a, to a fine point, of course. Yeah. But the, ma the basic idea is that the, the analogy would be, uh, I always say, imagine a bakery where 
the recipe book is huge volumes and anybody like a library can go in and take a copy of any recipe they want go home and bake it the only rule is that if you tweak that recipe and you add ingredients or take away ingredients or change the, the, the formula or the recipe you're required legally to put that new and improved version of the recipe back into the into the recipe book so that the volume becomes massive yeah. and then uh, the public the members or whatever the which is the public can go in and basically rate which are the best the cream of the crop they can take a best of volume of those recipes and then release it as a distrib as a cookbook okay yeah. so it's as a distribution of the best of all the recipes in the, this, these mammoth volumes that continuously grow so that every year, every six months, whatever, they come out with a new cookbook of the best of. And by doing that, uh, the, 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 you know, the whole entire community, everybody who, every baker in the world can contribute to this and they end up eventually, over time, they end up with a better brownie <laughs> than the proprietary ones. And, oh, by the way, the brownies are free. Yeah. Yeah, which so is, a, you know, instead of paying $500 for a brownie, you're paying zero. There's a there's an author who wrote, um, in the beginning was the command line, uh, who made the analogy between operating systems um, and, uh, and car dealerships, um, saying that mm -hmm. uh, um, Windows was analogous to uh, uh, a, um, like a Ford uh, dealership that had family sedans. And uh, you'd go there and get a reliable uh, family sedan, and uh, it wouldn't be all that attractive. It wouldn't have all the bells and whistles. And, you know, it would break down fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was inexpensive, and it and it, and it worked for most people. Mm -hmm. And across the street, you'd go and and uh, and go to the uh, um, uh, BMW uh, dealership, um, which would be the Mac. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was very, very pretty. The dashboard had uh, all these uh, wonderful things, very easy to drive, a very fast uh, and, and good performing uh, machine, but very expensive. <laughs> and then uh, across the street from that, there's this dealership where they sold these tanks. And they actually didn't sell them, just a whole bunch of crazy people just built these tanks. And, uh, and when you went to the dealership, they uh, would point you in the direction of a whole uh, uh, scrap heap full of parts, and <laughs> you just go ahead and, and they'll the, and they'll go ahead and take you back there and help you build this thing, yeah. and you can drive it off the lot for free. And uh, <laughs> whenever you have problems, you just come back, and uh, and a whole bunch of people will sit around, and scratch their heads, and help, help you, you tinker. Yeah. What's, uh, what's going? On. But well, that was that was back in the '90s, and yeah. things have improved a great deal. One of the one of the main reasons that they've improved is distributions like. Ubuntu, mm -hmm. which has taken this process, which was very homebrew, very do-it-yourself, and uh, really made it into a very sleek uh, and uh, and user-friendly distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, now bringing it back to to the average person who's watching this um, says, okay, this sounds interesting, but I really still have no clue what you're talking about. Let me let me explain a little bit. We're talking about something that is an operating system. It it is like Windows. It's like Mac, OS X, OS Leopard. Um, people, but people it replaces might, those. Yeah, people might uh, uh, have gotten word recently that Windows XP uh, has uh, has reached its end of life for support with Windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, and also people, a lot of people have uh, when they first initially upgraded to Vista had some very serious problems, they didn't like it, yeah. so a lot of people moved back to XP. Vista, XP are all versions of the Windows operating system. It's the, it's the core bit of software that mm -hmm. you install all the other software on. Right. Um, right, so you know, obviously when you turn your computer on you're going to see Windows, or you're going to see a Mac startup screen, or Ubuntu, so this replaces that, and that sounds really scary because um, first of all, you know, well, wait a minute, we use Windows at work or we use Mac at work and is my software going to run on it? There's all these issues like how do I install this um, without, you know, taking away ability. So we'll get to that in a second. But some of the, I want to talk about some of the reasons why you would even consider doing this. And to me, the, some of the selling points, the biggest selling points are, well, first of all, it's free. 
It's uh, free from a cost standpoint. It's also free from a freedom standpoint in that it's almost it's almost a movement. There are evangelists behind it that are you know very um, supportive of it because it's really basically it's worldwide programmers worldwide acting as volunteers for free, donating their time to improve all these products. So it's a movement that's for the betterment of mankind. Third world countries where they can, you know, they can't afford anything, they can barely afford food. If they can get the computers donated, they can put these this software on there, an operating system and applications and so on for free, absolutely free. So it's like for the betterment of all mankind, which and is And that's actually brilliant. being done, yeah. There's mm-hmm. a, the One Laptop uh, Per Child movement, right. um, which uh, UNESCO uh, uh, put together, mm-hmm. uh, the UN uh, um, and UNICEF and, and organizations like that. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they built a very lightweight, very uh, portable, very user-friendly machine, and they put Linux on it. And they uh, give it away to uh, children in the third world. Right. I read some time back that they were talking about switching from uh, Linux to Windows, which is kind of disheartening. I don't know if they've done that or not. but I, I don't think they're doing it with the one laptop per child, but there, is, there are a lot of competitors that came mm-hmm. out, yeah. uh, and, uh, and several others. You, you can essentially buy a Linux laptop um, for a hundred dollars, mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or yeah, three hundred, yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. But uh, but if you if they do replace with a Windows operating system, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the co- part of the cost of their PC is you know a few hundred dollars of the operating system. That's right. Um, so uh, you know when you're paying for your PC, Microsoft gets a few hundred dollars. Every single time, or well, maybe not that much, but fifty dollars somewhere, some some amount for sure. Right. Yeah, because yeah. some of the new PCs are four hundred dollars flat out. So I'll, you know, I, maybe like fifty bucks. But then, well, I think the part of the reason that that is driven down is because you know people, uh, Dell and several other large companies started to uh, sell PCs without Windows. Mm-hmm. So they started exactly. to sell them with Linux. That's right. They're selling with Linux. And then also the other thing is the what they call you know crapware, the stuff that. Actually, you know, there are some retailers that will charge you a, for a fee. They will remove all the garbage, the light versions of all that crap software that you do not want. It's basically just advertising. It's spam. And I, and they actually will charge you to take that off. Yeah. You know, it's like crazy. Because you know why it's on there in the first place is because they're getting paid to put it on there. So it's so bizarre. Like a, a manufacturer will pay Microsoft say just for, I don't know the amount, but some say $50 to put Windows on the machine. And then, so they're paying out 50 bucks. Meanwhile, then all this crap where these other companies are, um, they're agreeing to put that software on for another 50 bucks. So they spend 50 and then they make 50. And then the retailer will charge you 50 bucks to take it back off again. It's so crazy. Meanwhile, if you buy a PC that comes with Linux, uh, Ubuntu Linux or otherwise, you're just going to get what you want and you're not going to get any crapware. It's absolutely free. Okay, the other thing, there's several other huge selling points that you need to know about that um, you know we know about so we, you may, you know, we forget that it's so important to mention. All software is free. On Linux, all software is free. So when you go to the, like, the way you buy software is you go to add remove programs. On Windows, they have an add remove remove programs, but it should be really called remove this crap. That's what the button should be called because you don't actually ever add software by using that in Windows. But in Ubuntu, you actually do. So you click add remove programs and it pops open this thing that looks like a, it looks like a software store. You can click by category, you can type in the title and so on, and it'll list every application that uh, matches that description of the word you're looking for. Right. So if you needed uh, to install, say, say I needed to play um, a, a, a presentation that someone sent me, a mm-hmm. PowerPoint presentation. Um, normally, I would need a, a Microsoft Office right. or something of that nature, um, which does not come with uh, with your standard PC. That's right. I go ahead and look something up uh, in Ubuntu um, or presentation or PowerPoint. And uh, it'll come up with some software that plays that. Um, so I get an Office suite that has that directly, and it installs, and suddenly I can have that functionality. And I can do that with just about anything. Um, that's the one of the, the uh, beautiful things about um, Linux 
is uh, is um, specialized things that uh, generic PCs don't have. Right. Say I wanted to do some audio editing because uh, I'm a musician and I want to mm-hmm. record some tracks. Uh, one of the best programs for auto editing is uh, is you know a Linux based uh, program called Audacity. Audacity, yeah. Um, and they have a, they do have. This is another thing, by the way. I'm sorry to sidetrack that, but. You are probably using free open free and or open source software already, and you but don't know it. Yeah, you definitely like, are because it's on your phone. Mm-hmm. It's on uh, Linux. It's installed just about yeah. everywhere. Well, yeah. Th- there's the phones. There's the TiVo. There's the so many devices that you don't even they don't say Linux on them, but they're actually your cable box. Yeah, the en- yeah exactly the engine beneath it is Linux, even though it doesn't say Linux on it anywhere. That's one part. But even on your Windows and Mac PC, you're probably using free and or open source software, I can almost guarantee you. If you have ever used Firefox, that's free open source software. If you've used um, Audacity as another example, Audacity has versions, it's an audio editing, probably the best audio editing software, and it's free open source, and it's available in a version for Mac, I believe, and Windows for sure, and of course, Linux. Yeah, and Mac's, um, uh, Mac's operating system is very close to uh, the Linux operating system. It's, uh, it's OS X is a, uh, a a type of Unix, which is Linux is a type of Unix. Based on Unix from way back, yeah, like an earlier branch, and they then they closed it and made it proprietary. Yeah, put their name on it. Well, Steve Jobs did some uh, some interesting work after he left uh, Apple, and he started a company called Next, which mm-hmm. uh, which branched off Pixar branched out a bunch of other things, and then when he took over Apple again, um, Next had made this operating system. They weren't doing so well, so Apple bought them. Mm-hmm. There you have it. So, yeah, there's a whole history of the, leg- the legacy of basically, you know, companies borrowing technologies from other companies and then all the litigation that follows and all that nonsense. But, yeah, it, it has its roots in Unix of, uh, originally. Um, and then um, and the other thing is, let's see, so we talk we talked about um, Firefox, Audacity, and the other thing that you're using, or you may be using, or interested, if you're not, you should, <laughs> is OpenOffice.org. With yeah. Ubuntu Linux, you know, like you mentioned Microsoft Office, which is very expensive. App, I think Microsoft makes most profit off of um, Office, I think, and maybe Windows is number two, or the reverse. But those are the two main profit centers. And if you, like a friend of mine, a girl friend of mine called me the other day and she says, don't you use this thing, Open Office? And I said, yes. She said because she went, she bought a new computer. She tries to install her Office, her Microsoft Office software on it. And it says, oh, no, you can't do that. You already have it on the machine. And, you know, and of course, you can go through their process and you have to call them and explain to Microsoft why you're now using it. On imagine this. Okay, imagine if you bought a Janet Jackson CD, okay, and you played that CD in your living room, right, and then the next day you took it and put it in your car to play it, and it says, oh no, I'm not going to play. <laughs> you got to call Sony Records and say, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, but I have to explain to you that I was listening to it at home yesterday and now I want to listen to it in my car. Right. And you got to get their permission with a special serial number to type into your car to play that disc. It's absurd, but that's how it works. So you buy a new computer, you got to call Microsoft and explain and get permission to use it on your new computer and promise you're not going to use it on your old computer anymore, whatever. So she yeah. said, forget that. Instead of you know doing that or paying another... $500, she decided to go to openoffice.org and download OpenOffice. And what that is, is the open source free version of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Access, basically, right? Those are the, and then another one, too. There's a calc or something. Yeah, they have a, like an Excel. A draw. There's another one, draw. Yeah, they've, mm-hmm. uh, yeah there's, a, there's an open source version um, or a, a equivalent mm-hmm. of just about anything out there. Uh, and they have versions for Windows and Mac, so you may already be using this stuff you know, so it's 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 creeping into the Windows environment without even using Ubuntu or Linux. With Firefox, actually, I heard Firefox has more people using it than the newest version of Internet Explorer. It's that is a metric that will never be settled. Um, <laughs> one of one of the reasons uh, um, that uh, the numbers get so skewed on that is because of corporate environments. Mm-hmm. Um, corporate environments uh, are really locked down and they have very strict rules about what type of software can be on each machine. Mm-hmm. So you have all of these empty cubicles that uh, oh. that never use uh, really Internet Explorer or anything else to browse. These are you know people who are just doing their jobs. And, uh, but they're counting those but as they're Internet counting, Explorer yeah, clients. Yeah, they're counting those as Internet Explorer clients. So yeah. that 
So if, it, like, if they the open the browser the once, numbers, yeah. If they open the browser once in, during the installation well, or something, and the, and the browser is like attached to the operating yeah, system. That's yeah. uh, one of the. Uh, which is such an irony because you know they had all that litigation about that. They they went to court and proved that oh no 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 Internet Explorer is an integral part of the operating system that cannot be separated. And now I heard that in Europe the they're going to court to do the opposite to take out to take out the media player yeah. because they're they're saying oh no media player is uh, something about. Um, uh, what do you call it? Monopoly, because there are other media players that you could download. So the, it's similar to the browser thing. They're they're claiming that the media player is an integral part of Windows, and they're saying, okay, no, you cannot distribute Windows with the media player in it. Anyway, it's so it's funny because open such source, a, yeah, it's such a mess. Mickey Mouse mess. But the, the, that's why I really believe that free open source software is the future because there's no issues like that. Suddenly, there's no issues whatsoever. But yeah, you, you, you're really separating a lot of uh, of what becomes a, a corporate bureaucratic process from mm -hmm. actually delivering media and yeah. delivering um, uh, you know, a, uh, an application to people. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the one of the largest one of the best things about the open source movement, about the free software movement is um, is you are actually becoming closer to the people who are making the software. Mm -hmm. When I purchase uh, Microsoft Office, um, not only do uh, you know the, the software mill that is in uh, in um, uh, Washington uh, that uh, Microsoft employs is a is a bunch of programmers who maybe spend a month or two on one function of that program mm -hmm. and then they're done and then they're on some other project right so um, you're never actually uh, you know when you file a bug report when you say there's a problem when you do things like that it never will get to the person who wrote the software ever like I I imagine that, that I heard I, I read somewhere that the um, the number of people who actually understand the core core code of Windows is in the world is just like a handful or less sure, yeah. who actually really understand it because it's been added to and patched and corrupted and changed so many times. Imagine and it's so it's secret. Yeah. Imagine secret. a huge building that, uh, like, uh, you know, you have 150 architects mm -hmm. working on at any uh, point in the process, right. and you have uh, like you know hundreds of construction crews going you know through and starting up again and 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 building certain sections. Mm -hmm. It's a, it becomes just a, a puzzle. And every month or two, you're assigned to a completely different aspect of the project, or even a completely right. different building. Whereas, whereas <laughs> with a, a free software, most projects are very small teams. They're very dedicated to the process because this is generally something that, like, uh, you know, I'm a programmer. I got a, a wild hair that I really need an application to do this, mm -hmm. and I build it, and lots of people like it, and I'm the person mm -hmm. responsible. And you then can hire me, the person who wrote the entire software package to help you train or train install, or, install or, or improve it, it mm -hmm. or whatever and mm -hmm. and that's uh, and that's kind of the best of both worlds because mm -hmm. then you have a free product that you can actually get close to the person who authored it right and and actually uh, you know uh, give them the support and also uh, improve your product in the end they're, they're the developers, the programmers, their their heart is in it. That's the difference. They're they're two big motivating factors. One is their heart is in it. This is something that they're passionate about. They chose this project. It wasn't assigned to them for a paycheck. They're doing it for the for the for the benefit of all mankind as as uh, their gift to the world. But at the same time, they can also have a monetary reward too because even though the software is their gift to the world, as you said, they can. Uh, as a personal consultant, they can sell their consulting services for training and support and um, you know customization or whatever. So they can still you know make a career out of the side effects that you know all the sidebar services that they can personally offer, even though they're giving the product away to the public. And because it's open source, all the rest of the programmers in the world can say this is good. I can think of a way to make it better. So everybody's constantly making it better. Right. 
also it's not like with uh, the proprietary companies they you know like Windows for example they have to come out with you know this it's this year it's ME then it's XP then it's 2000 then it's NT then it's seven or whatever bizarre thing the marketing team came up with they have to like scrap the whole thing we used to call it um, we had an acronym um, M A B F N A R, <laughs> which was um, the new version of Windows, moved all the buttons around for no apparent reason. <laughs> that's what it was, you know. Like that's all they did. They just moved all the buttons around for no apparent reason, so you could get you could buy certification and be certified in the new version, so they could sell more training and nonsense. But basically, they almost like scrapping. Like Vista is a great example. They scrap the whole operating system, supposedly create one from scratch. The same way cars in the auto industry change the whole body style because that way I'll know you're using an old version. You're driving an right. old model. You don't have the new model. And that's the reason because they have to sell it again and again and again. Whereas with Linux and, and all the applications that go along with that, it's been in development for since for 50 years. If you count the Unix days, it's been in development. Like It's kind of like the tortoise and the hare. The, you know, open source is the tortoise. It's moving along very, very, very slowly, but it's evolving, and they never throw it all out. They're constantly improving it, whereas the other one has to throw it out every single year. They've got a billion dollars, but they're they've got teams of programmers. But it's just such a chaotic mess because they have to reinvent the wheel from scratch every year or two. Yeah, <laughs> and they and they, you know, the the model that that Microsoft came up with for selling software is uh is really uh, one of the uh, one of the most ridiculous models ever. It's, it's very much like the recording industry. What uh, like what they come up with is uh, okay, we've uh, we've developed a software package and then we're going to stamp it on CDs. And then we'll sell each CD for an amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the actual developers who worked on that project and actually coded every bit of that got paid an hourly salary and uh, and will only see will never see any residual money from that again. Mm. Um, they'll only see the uh, the hours that they spent on the portion that they worked on. That's true. Um, and you know, Windows will continue to sell that product long after that programmer has worked on it. Sure, they made they made X dollars per hour, and that's it. That's their paycheck, and they own nothing that they created. Meanwhile, if they had actually developed the same thing, if a, if a team, the little team that developed that thing, if they had off on their own, didn't work for Microsoft, created the thing, they could give it away completely, mm -hmm. but they would get royal residuals in the, in the fact that they would be the worldwide experts on that product, and they would be in huge consulting demand, and they would make big money just doing consulting and training and things, you know, on their own. So it's, I, it's, I say this, like you say, it's very much, I was going to say that too, very much like the recording industry because back in, you know, back in the day when we had records and CDs, <laughs> which we still do, but they're on their way out, back in the day when we had record stores in the mall, remember that? The, uh, <laughs> the thing is that I, I always say um, it's kind of like, in a sense, it's almost like the end of the age of copyright, that if you support artists you have to support the free sh freedom of information, basically sharing information, and this is how it works. When back in the day, okay, an artist, uh, Diana Ross, you know, whatever, had a you know a platinum album or something, she would make money by radio play royalties. She would make um, money off the record sales, and she would make money off of live concerts. But the record sales might be only a few pennies. Where you pay eighteen ninety nine for the CD in the retail store, only a few pennies may go to the artist, right. and all the, basically all the profit goes to the record label. The the men the suits the men, <laughs> the, the guys who make nothing but money. Yeah. Okay, yeah, they've in, they've invested in the in the recording studios and, and they they did a lot of advertising and so well, on. Well, and and they charge the artist actually for that. <laughs> did really? you know? Yeah, yeah. No. When, when, you, when you sign to a label um, as a recording artist. Um, everything that they give you, uh, the recording time, everything, uh, the uh, wardrobe, whatever, um, uh, is accounted for in the uh, in the residual sales. So they deduct that from your earnings. Oh my gosh! Yes, they will. That's even even worse than I thought. But here's the thing: so if you only make pennies on each record that's sold, you make you're still going to make your radio royalties and you're still going to make your live performances, but you only make pennies on the records. Imagine, okay, now, now we're up to 2009, the way the world works now. 
first of all, you don't have to pitch your song and, and have a casting couch and, and sell some record label and I got a record agreement, a record contract. No, everybody has a record contract. We all have a record contract. Just record it. Yeah. You, the equipment is so cheap that almost anybody can record it in their in their living room or their garage or whatever. And you can you can record the music if you've got talent. You rise to the top, so it's the ultimate form of democracy. It's distributed freely on the internet. If you if you distribute it, you can you can become insanely popular in Russia, in China, in you know Australia, whatever. You can become a worldwide hit in just a few days. And guess what? Here's the thing: you'll make more money than you did before. People, the, the record labels and all these people they're brainwashing you the the opposite. But the truth is. You still make the royalties um, on radio plays because it's very easy to control that. You're still going to make a check. You're going to get if it's copyrighted. You're going to make a check from that. You're still going to make the money from live concerts because there's only one you until we have cloning. So, but you you make nothing on the records, this actual record sales, but you only made a few pennies anyway. Okay. And you're popular in Russia. You know, you, you're you've got global distribution. If your stuff is good, if yeah. you're if you're good. You can make a lot more money. It's, it's all about uh, gaining a following and uh, and and being able to uh, to leverage that following. I mean, look at uh, what Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails have done. Exactly. I mean, they they already had a following. They released their albums out to the world for free. They said, "Okay, pay us what you think the songs are worth," and they made insane amounts of sales. I think I read that they made like they broke records of um, more than a. I don't know, million dollars or something in the first three days or something. Some crazy amount. They gave it away and they made more money in a shorter period of time than any other album release or something. They they gave it away and they basically, what we would call it like a love offering. Like they said, you know, take it for free. If you really love it, send us send us 20 bucks right. and, you know, we'll give you a CD <laughs> or whatever. Or send us 75 bucks and we'll send an autographed one or something like three different special editions. Yeah. And their fans are, are fans and they appreciate them, and it's like saying, um, you know, pay what you think it's worth. G- give us if if you appreciate us, support us, and people do. And and it's also a numbers game because only a percentage of people are going to actually send money. But when you distribute it globally, worldwide, to millions and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people all over the planet, when it, the, when the tip jar is available to everyone, everyone. in the whole world, um, you're going to make enough money. That's right. There's a um, and that's and that's. You know that that compensates uh, for the model that open source software and and free software originated. That has uh, has gone through and uh, and really extended itself to the music world, to the uh, um, to the uh, um, to Hollywood. Um, if you look at uh, uh, one of the top sellers right now um, on Amazon and uh, and iTunes. Was the sing along blog, Doctor Horrible sing along blog? Have you heard of this? No. It's a uh, <laughs> it's a uh, Josh Whedon, the uh, guy who ca- came up with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, okay. He uh, during the last writer strike, he just got some friends together and they did a uh, a show, a musical, using just uh, the the equipment that he had in his house. Um, and uh, and okay, Josh Whedon, yeah, he can afford some good equipment. <laughs> But the thing is now, with open source and free software, and you know, really cheap consumer electronics right, like this, so cheap, yeah. you can you can go ahead and have a full production studio of any kind of media you want. Yeah. The bar, the technical bar, has lowered to an extent that all you really need is a good idea and mm-hmm. some you know elbow grease. Yeah, and that's you're, good. And you're and you're you're ready to. Uh, Put your art out there. Yeah. Distribute. You know, I really view it as a as a s- almost a, a philosophical, a spiritual thing because it's it's uh, it's the idea that you know if you have talent, whatever it is, whether you're a programmer or an artist, a singer, or actor, whatever, um, you have this God-given talent. We call it. Well, it's not really yours. It's it's given to you to share, and that's the whole point of it. And you know, you can think of it as no, it's mine, 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 mine. And you know, people. Somebody said um, recently that. You know <laughs> how they felt when somebody said to to someone else, you know, oh, I I love your work. I, I bought your CD and I shared it with all my friends, and they were like, ah, you know. But really, that's not a bad thing. You've got to change your mindset. It's a brave new world we're in. The artists are afraid of that. Yeah, when you when someone says they bought their CD or like I 
downloaded your CD illegally and I shared it with all my friends, you should jump for joy and say thank you because now you're, you're more famous. You, your name is out there more. There was a guy who actually published a book and it was, I don't know if it was bestseller, probably not, I don't know, but it was a book that was wide distribution. It was at Barnes & Noble and Borders, whatever. And this author, I read about it, um, he actually took his own book and after it was in stores, right? And he, he had got a PDF copy of it. He uploaded it to the BitTorrent sites mm -hmm. and distributed it free. Of course, his publisher was not pleased. He got sued by his publisher. But here's what happened. He went from selling um, something like, you know, 10 or, I don't know, like a million copies or something to like a hundred million copies. Yeah. And he, that's where I got the example. He w became phenomenally popular in and Russia. And they were buying his book. Because, you know, look, if you every 100 people who downloaded it illegally or legally, whatever, um are sharing it, they're talking about it, and it's all, if it's really good, if your stuff is good, that's the key. If, if your stuff is good, he became so popular that his sales were a hundred times what they were before. He, he yeah. got rich. And you don't have to be the best at anything. I mean, really, if you if if you can keep up production, if you can be prolific at anything, mm -hmm. uh, people crave uh, you know content, quality content. That's any right. any content half the time. I yeah. mean, it doesn't even have to be quality. Look at what we watch on television. Yeah, I was just gonna say. Um, so if you <laughs> Spanish if language television. <laughs> yeah, if you, but but <laughs> you know, having a good flow of episodic content, having yeah. a good flow of any kind of content is is really important to people. Um, people want to be entertained. People want new things to read, new things to uh, in, in play with. Innovation and in software. And um, the, uh, what was the other thing I was going to say about that? Oh, I truly believe that everybody has a unique gift, and you know what it is. It's it's the thing that people say, "Wow, you're you're really brilliant." with when it comes to this, and that's your gift. And when everybody has one, I believe everybody has a unique gift. Look at. Uh, What's her name? Sarah Boyle. And by the way, this illustrates two things. One, everybody has a gift, and it may be hidden under a bushel, but everybody has a, a, a gift inside them, and they know they do. You know you do. And the other thing is the power of the Internet, the democracy of the Internet. She's from a little village in the U.K., and in three days, three days, she is a household word, right. household name all over the planet, the, the most popular viewed video in the internet, like over 100 million, last I heard. And this, views. Is a, this is a show that does not get broadcast in the U.S. Right. Right? Right. It's the internet. It's absolutely internet. Right. There is no more, you know, real TV. Right. There is only new media. So the internet the internet really set up um, things like Ubuntu to, to be built. To uh, have this huge cooperation, and what I think, uh, what I think is not only uh, is it a great thing because it's free and uh, and it encourages all of this uh, um, wonderful uh, work that can be done. But the thing is, um, uh, when you're <laughs> Come on. The, the financial situation right now is not that great in the U.S. You don't have uh, the extra money to go out and uh, upgrade all of your software to, uh, uh, you know, uh, buy the software that you need for everything. So uh, you can go ahead and get Ubuntu. You can install it on your machine. You don't even have to uninstall um, Windows. Uh, right. You can install it. Uh, what is the? Uh, I'd say it's called a uh, Wubi. There's there's Wubi, actually a yeah. couple different ways now. Well, there, I'm gonna I'm gonna, take, well, I'm gonna can, come back to that. We can put links on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, I want to tell. I want to point out a couple things before I forget that are so important. Ubuntu basically there's virtually no such thing as antivirus software for Ubuntu Linux. And why? Because there's virtually no such thing as a virus for Linux, for Ubuntu. There's there's no such thing as a virus. You don't have to worry about viruses, adware, spyware, nothing like that. The thing it is, the, thing, uh, the analogy that a lot of people uh, use with the free software movement and malicious code is that um, uh, free software is very much like having a house in the middle of Manhattan that's com that is completely transparent. It's mm -hmm. a glass exactly. house, and it's completely lit all the time. Right. If anybody breaks into your house, everybody's gonna know. Everybody can see it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So that so that code is protected by being transparent, very much like uh, like uh, uh, our, you know President Obama wants to uh, uh, protect. Um, the public by keeping the government transparent. We'll see if that actually to comes to fruition, thing. but that's that's the idea. That's the idea. That's the idea. So, uh, the exactly. transparency is good, and that's mm -hmm. recognized, yeah. and that's uh, and that's why you don't have yeah. viruses.
because if anybody puts any malicious code into uh, Linux or into anything else, yeah. everybody's going to see it, it's and nobody wants that. Very simple concept. It's just like the city's safer in the daytime because we're protected by the light of day. Everyone can see everything that's happening, and there, there's so many eyes on it that if anything fishy was going on, people would notice. Right. The other thing, you know... I, this b baffles me that you know Microsoft comes out with you know two or three critical security updates every single week, yet it's still com completely vulnerable to, to well, all the this. Endeavor software makes your makes your machine run slow. Oh yeah. It's, uh, it's Not to mention the firewalls and all that on top of it. It's just horrible. Yeah. The um, uh, what was I going to say so like. The, oh, there, well, there was a hacker convention where they, they had this annual hacker convention and they had like I don't know how many different operating systems maybe you know what but what they did is they had um, they, they have a contest I think they win like $5,000 cash prize plus the machine plus the machine that was being yeah. it was being hacked into and I believe if I remember right um, OS, uh, Mac OS Leopard took the least it took like four seconds to hack right into it Windows took like 28 seconds or something crazy. There was only one operating system that no hacker in the whole world could hack into, at least not during for that, that time frame. Yeah. Right, during that, it was like a, they gave them a week or two, I think. Yeah. yeah. And uh, during the uh, the entire convention, I mm -hmm. think it was like a weekend. Okay. Um, but it's, uh, uh, DEF CON is the, uh, that's is, what it was. and you can, you can look that up on your Cool. Own. Check it out. And it was Ubuntu Linux running on a laptop that nobody could hack into. So that's very, very impressive. Now, Ubuntu does have uh, critical security updates because they do find security leaks or problems or whatever, but they're patched almost instantly, and they only they seem to only come out like maybe once a month or once every two months or something, yeah. not like two or three times a week like Windows. So it's just something very very bizarre to me. It seems like Microsoft, with its um, so many security holes, is either it's either inept or I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Why it would be so so vulnerable, but it's not in their best interest to. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're 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 in the business of selling software. So delivering, um, you know, spending a lot of money um, on improving certain things that don't actually sell software. Yeah. Is not the is not what's to the their motivation? yeah. It's not their well. Actually, it does sell software because they own antivirus software companies too, and it sells antivirus software. That's true, yeah. Okay, so it's kind of like if you if you so it's actually the conqueror. Yeah, if you the an analogy of that is if you if you have a monopoly and you're the only home builder in the country, and you also sell sec ADT security systems. Yeah. What kind of locks are you going to put on the doors and windows? Little maybe little plastic twist ties or something, right? Because you're selling the security systems too. I don't know. I I'm just saying, you know, it's just a little bit uh, funny why they can't finally get their security. Plus, another thing that could impact it is the fact that if they scrap the operating system and they, they figure, you know, we're going to come out with something completely new. Oh, no, all of our focus is now on Windows 7 or Windows 9 or whatever the next thing is, that they they don't stick with one long enough to actually perfect it. It's it's just a, a moving target. It's like a consumable product that they just scrap and start all over. And the, Well, we'll fix that in the next one. Right, yeah. If they want to sell the next uh, batch of copies. Mm -hmm. And, you, and the, the this this grassroots movement of free open source, uh, what you wanna, whatever you want to call it, freedom of information, that sort of this movement, kind of uh, goes against corporate profit. I like to call it independent software. Independent software, yeah, <laughs> of all kinds, including music content of, of any kind. It, it goes against uh, corporate profit, so that's you know that's the battle. But meanwhile, these programmers are working at Apple and Microsoft and Google or whatever during the day, and they're doing this volunteer programming basically at well, night. And, and, and to, to the credit of a lot of companies, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies actually do donate the time of their developers mm -hmm. to um, open source and free software. Adobe has, uh, has released a ton of products mm -hmm. under open source and, and portions of their products. Right. And um, Sun does. Sun sponsors Sun open office. Sun did open office. Open office and uh, mm -hmm. and um, Java, the entire platform is open source. Oh, okay. yeah, and uh, you know another thing too. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about examples that of how you are using Linux. You may not realize it, but if you've ever used Google, um, Google, their their applications are almost entirely running in Linux. 
and they're, even their corporation, the majority of their desktops are Linux in, as em, employees inside the company. Of course, they have obviously they have other operating systems too because they have to cater to the to all the users. But yeah. most of their uh, systems, even internally, are, are Linux. But all their web properties are run in Linux and open source. Yeah, all of their servers run on Linux. And uh, well, actually, their applications are not open source, but they're run on Linux, which Linux is open source. Right. And then um, the other thing. That is, oh yeah, about it, about buying and installing applications. It's I was saying earlier about how you go to add remove programs. They lists every program by category or topic or uh, you know whatever it is you're looking for, and then it also has user ratings. It's almost like a software store, yeah. but to buy the software and install it means put a check mark in the box and hit OK. And guess what? You bought it for free, and you installed it. Yep. And uninstalling it is taking the check mark out of the box, and, and that's it. Uh, most of the time, there's no restart. There's nothing like that. It's just right. running on your system right then. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had to restart when I installed software. No, the only the only time I've ever had to restart is uh, when they've upgraded the entire operating system. The kernel, which yeah. they do automatically for yeah. you. So that's uh, the other thing. It, you know, Windows does that. Obviously, Windows up. Windows, but with Ubuntu Linux, it but updates you'll never, all software. You'll never software. go from XP to Vista. No. With Windows, no, no, automatically, no. Um, even if you want to pay that way, yeah. Um, with uh, with uh, with Linux, with Ubuntu, um, you can go from one major release to the next major release and keep all of your data yeah. and keep everything just fine. I mean, uh, my my dad just uh, had to upgrade to uh, Vista not too long ago, and he had to, uh, you know, it it was such a hassle for him to take all of the data off. And uh, and you know back it up and and reformat and get that all taken care of. That he just you know dropped his uh, box off at Best Buy and, and got the uh, uh, whatever the uh, Geek Squad. Geek Squad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To I take care of that, and that cost him uh, uh, you know a, a lot more than uh, than had he been able to. Uh, you got to get him onto Ubuntu. <laughs> I, we just we've been talking about it. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's he's been running the uh, Webby. Oh, the movie, yeah. It's, so that's what that's another thing that um, about in how do you migrate to it? One way is the old-fashioned way of uh, like what you would have to do if you're going from one version, if you're going to X from XP to Vista or something. Um, you have to back up all of your data, then install the thing, tell it to take the whole entire hard disk, and then restore your data. And don't worry, your all your documents like uh, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, all those things work within OpenOffice. In fact, actually, IT departments and corporate IT departments say that OpenOffice is more compatible with more versions of Microsoft products than Microsoft's own products. Yeah, because, because a lot of times uh, if you go for, if you have, if you're sharing a file between uh, someone who has OpenOffice 6 and OpenOffice 10 or whatever the versions are now, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be a lot of problems throughout, but the OpenOffice guys... You mean Microsoft, the first example yeah, was Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but if, uh, but if, uh, the open office guys needed to be compatible with all those all versions, so they've gone ahead and made the translations between mm -hmm. all of those files. Yeah. So if if you uh, if you're ever in an office where someone says, "Oh, I can't read this file my client sent me because it's in the wrong version of uh, you know of Office," boom. Just open up open office and you can do the translation for them. Exactly. And that's intentional. There's no reason. The only reason new versions of Microsoft Office wouldn't read the oldest version of Microsoft Office is because they intentionally blocked it so that it wouldn't to force you to buy a new version of it. That's it. But or they just didn't, you know, that wasn't a price point with them. They weren't yeah. going to spend the money on the development of doing that because it, it, it was not in their and interest. It's not, it, do, it doesn't generate so profit. It's, the, it's not necessarily malicious, um, but it is, you know, it's not, uh, it's not consumer oriented. Right. And uh, it's either, it's either not consumer oriented or it's incompetence that kills us, yeah. not, not uh, straight evil, yeah. generally. Their motivation is in conflict. Their motivation is directly in conflict with the consumer, really, because they're trying to make money for the least amount of investment. And whereas with free open source movement, they're totally in concert with the with the consumer the, of it because yeah. they're the all developers the are team. actually trying to uh, create the best product for their for, for the for their own um, for the benefit of their reputation, mm -hmm. um, and to essentially uh, you know they consider themselves craftsmen. Their um, personal pride. Yeah, sure. they w they want to uh, they want to yeah they want to uh, carve out the best statue. 
so that they can, uh, so that people can look at it and like, wow, that is an amazing piece of software. Did right. you know the guy who wrote it? That's true. It's like art. You could sign your name to it, which, whereas, you know, like Windows XP, whose name is on that? You know, it's just like it's this generic, right. you know, yeah, building no, full of people. No one knows, uh, no one knows really the person who, uh, who wrote Windows. Um, but I think everybody knows uh, the person who originally launched uh, Linux, at least in the Linux world, mm-hmm. everybody knows him, um, right. Linus Trevelyas. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And uh, and he <laughs> has uh, he's been able to because of that, um, and because he he manages a good portion of the code still, he's been able to essentially uh, write his own check throughout the world. And sure. he's not a he's not a Bill Gates millionaire, but he's. He he does well enough for himself to be perfectly content with his family and yeah. and do what he loves. Yeah, and that's really the best of worlds. Yeah, he's very famous, and I'm sure he's doing very well. And that's the thing. That again, it's just when you give to the world, you you can't help but you receive it back. You absolutely, that you you won't be able to stop it just by your own uh, fame and recognition and being in demand. I'm sure he's yeah. in demand. You know, as a as a speaker and as a you know. Um, yeah. Obviously, all of his professional talent. Google has paid him several times to speak. Um, yeah, they s- he goes everywhere. That's fantastic. And that's a um, and the, another thing about uh, making the transition to Linux um, is that because you had the keys to the kingdom, as it were, you can mm-hmm. you know go ahead and do anything you want with the system. Um, that gives you the opportunity to branch into uh, development or any type of media that normally would have a very high cost um, uh, barrier and a uh, learning barrier. And uh, you know, because there's a community, because of these things, you can actually learn a great deal um, about coding, about uh, uh, you know, um, media production, about all of these things without having to uh, um, spend a, an insane amount of money on training through a proprietary product. When you've looked at the cost of software lately, you know, remember, all the software is free, so there is basically like an equivalent or sometimes better version of all the major software, um, like we already mentioned, Office, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, Access, uh, your Photoshop, your um, would be GIMP, and uh, video editing software, financial, like QuickBooks, Quicken, um, is new cash, but almost every kind of software that you can imagine, there is an equivalent, and sometimes better version that's free and open source that you can just click and install. It's like having every piece of software in a giant software superstore free, like a public library. You just take it home and install it, and that's it. But you don't have to go anywhere. You just click the checkbox, install it, so you can try out several different programs that do the same thing and decide which one you like the best it's all free so you can if you're depending on what you're doing especially if you're doing it on more than one computer you can save thousands and thousands of dollars in a small whether it's a home consumer or uh, a small business or even a large corporation there are a lot of universities (coughs) and businesses and even governments that are standardizing on Linux because of that the cost savings is enormous Mm -hmm. in fact I read somewhere that um, something about the European Union and several governments standardizing on Ubuntu Linux and, and eliminating Windows. Yeah, I know Munich uh, and several other cities have gone ahead and made the transition. A lot of uh, cities in the U.S. have made the transition as well. Um, and it, it saves a great deal of money. And for most uh, business most business applications, the, uh, the barrier for entry um, uh, is very low uh, it's, uh, because the interface is very similar. For some things like video editing right now, uh, the uh, there isn't the best user interfaces. Um, but uh, as a counter to that, um, if you know what you're doing, you can actually do a lot more mm. with the Linux software than you can with the uh, the uh, standard um, off-the-shelf software. <coughs> um, you just uh, it's just not pretty, and you have to read <laughs> some and invest a little bit of time. Yeah. We're using um, Kino, and then there's a one called Cinderella that's um, being completely rewritten from scratch, and it's supposed to be going to be really, really good yeah. when it comes out. Yeah, I I, I <laughs> used to use those, but I gave up, and I'm just using FFmpeg. FFmpeg mm-hmm. is a command line uh-huh. pro- uh, a program, sure. but it it does everything I want to do at all with video. Mm-hmm. I can I can change. I can slice, dice, mm-hmm. remix, change the uh, audio, um, uh, do anything I want, and uh, 
but the thing is knowing knowing the proper commands, and that's and that's yeah, it's a barrier for entry. Yeah. But well, we're wrap, we're we're out of time. So we're going to wrap it up. But um, check out ubuntu.com. Is u b u n t u dot com to, for more information about Ubuntu Linux. And um, I want to thank you, Matthew Jording from opengotham.com. Check out his website and his services. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot.